Hi, I'm Joe Chura and welcome to 630 Naperville. On this program, you'll get tips on how to keep it clean in the kitchen, find out why interest rates shouldn't be a deal breaker in buying a home, and talk about the one word that's on everyone's mind, recession. But first, we're off to Nike Park to learn why sportsmanship is absolutely essential. Hi, I'm Samira Luthman with the Naperville Park District, and welcome to Park It. I'm here today at the district's dynamic Nike Sports Complex, and I'm joined by Director of Recreation, Andrea Coates. Andrea and I are going to be talking today about the importance of sportsmanship and how it impacts everybody from players to parents. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. So we know that we hear the terms good sportsmanship, be a good sport, things of that nature. And it's not only related to sports and games, but just competition in general. But what exactly is sportsmanship? Sportsmanship in my eyes is good behavior, respect, um, fairness, equality on the, in the sports field, out at a game, during an event or activity. Really runs the gamut, it's yes. everybody. Yes. And I know that as a society, we've kind of had an issue with sportsmanship. We, we see it kind of across the board. What are some of those issues that we're seeing? I think the biggest one right off the bat is just overall disrespect. We're seeing that in everything. Um, not just the players, but the whole, everybody who's there. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, ab physical abuse, verbal abuse. It's just gotten out of control. People don't, they don't really know where their boundaries are. And I think the competitive world that we live in is also adding to that and contributing. Um, there's so much focus on winning and not as much on the development and the fun. And nowadays it's really, just become insults and you know just the, the verbal and, and talking back and players are doing the same thing on the field. And that's really taken the fun out of it when it should be something that's fun and kind of good spirited yes, in nature. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what happens if we don't do something to fix this? Where where do we go? Well I think right now we're starting out um, we're gonna start to lose people participating because I think people are getting tired of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know the kids they, they want to come and do the sport and have fun sure. and developmentally, and they're really losing that. So I think that's a big part. I think the other part of this is that we're running into now that we see today is that our, our officials, we're losing our officials. Right. And that's been a big problem. I know the National, um, the National High School Association for um, Athletics, mm -hmm. you know, they, in 2018 and 2019, they saw 50,000 depart. Stressful. And, yes, yeah. And some of that is due to, you know, the sportsmanship that's happening out on the field. Right. And people aren't getting that enjoyment out of the game anymore. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, I mean, you talk about youth sports, you talk about adult sports, it really doesn't matter. But you look at the adults and you go, well, there's got to be some responsibility here for, you know, adults to step up and, and do something to help promote respect and sportsmanship. What does that even look like? I think right now, the biggest thing is our kids, our youth are watching us as adults. For sure. And the way that we're acting, and I'm not talking even on the field, I'm just talking about in general. Right. The way that they're acting at the grocery store or out on the sidewalk or in a business meeting. I think that we have to be really conscious of what we're doing because they are watching and they are modeling after us. Right. So I think that is a big part of, you know, what we can do. And then I also think that just staying positive and being encouraging in anything that we do mm -hmm. um, is, is good modeling for our youth. And as we get ready to wrap up here, are there three quick tips that you can share as we try to move forward and, and be positive and be, you know, try to have a good attitude and try to promote good sportsmanship? Yes, I do. I think uh, right off the bat, respect. Got to have respect. Right. And I'm not talking about respect for just the game, but the game, each other, and ourselves as people. So I think that's one thing, supporting your teammates and to some degree supporting the other team. You know, this, right. you know, really being part of, of that. Um, just overall that, positive attitude. And that camaraderie. Exactly. Yeah, the and it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's about that experience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So I think that's the biggest part of sportsmanship. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you being here with me Thank today. You. That's it for this time on Park It. I appreciate you joining us and I'll see you next time.
Hi, I'm happy to welcome Julie Sanfilippo, Registered Dietitian at Edward Elmhurst Health to 630 Naperville. Thanks for joining us today, Julie. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. So over the course of the last few years, I keep hearing about clean eating. Can you help define that for us? Yeah, it's definitely become a more popular term. Um, and although there's no agreed upon definition of what clean eating means, the general idea behind it is that we try to eat and choose foods in their most whole or natural state with minimal processing and added ingredients, a lot like our ancestors ate years ago. Why should people want to eat clean? For the health benefits. So when you start to clean up your diet and you eliminate those processed packaged foods and you prepare more things at home, um, you're naturally going to start to lower the amount of salt that you eat, the sugar that you take in, your fat, your calories, which uh, a side effect of that could be weight loss. So, so many wonderful benefits related to health and nutrition. Uh, clean eating encourages a wide variety of nutrients and food groups. Um, so for mostly the health benefits. Now, I've always been told, and I try to do this as well, is to really shop the perimeter of the grocery stores versus in the aisles where you have a lot of the processed food. Mm -hmm. Is that something you'd recommend? Yeah, that's correct. So the perimeter of the grocery stores, a lot of your whole foods are located, your fruits and vegetables, meats and dairy, where those um, aisles, you know, you, ha you get caught in a lot of those processed and packaged items. I do know, and I've, I've struggled with this as well, when it comes to eating clean, mm -hmm. it just seems it's more arduous mm -hmm. versus, you know, going to those aisles, putting something in, in the microwave that may be already done, mm -hmm. um, adding like cereal is a good example, just throw some milk in there. Is there ways to make that process easier? That's a great question. I think a lot of the reasons why people eat junk food is it's quick and easy. You know, it's convenient to grab a bag of chips. It's easy to grab a candy bar. It's not always easy to eat that salad if it's not washed and cut or to have the pineapple if it's not peeled and cored. Um, so with clean eating, a big part of it is meal planning and prep. So we come home from the grocery store, we wash our fruits and vegetables, we cut them up, we leave the fruit on the counter in a nice fruit bowl. We make them very accessible. We want those good foods just as easy to eat as the not so good things. That makes sense. So what about things like protein bars? Because there's, like if you go to Whole Foods, there's hundreds of protein bars. There are probably hundreds, <laughs> I would assume. Uh, but an awful lot. And they all say like minimal ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, is there such thing as like a healthy protein bar that's packaged? Right. So it's not that you can't eat anything out of a bag or out of a box. You know, it's okay to have some packaged items in your life, but you want to be a very educated eater and look at those food labels and more importantly in the ingredient list. So the ingredient list is listed underneath the nutrition fact label and it lists all the ingredients from the most prevalent to the least prevalent. So a couple of things when you're looking at those lists is if it has a laundry list of ingredients, that's a red flag. And if those ingredients are unrecognizable to you or they're not things that you would cook with in your home, that's an even bigger red flag. Got it. One of the things I know on, on the labels now, it says added sugar. Mm -hmm. I think that was a recent, mm -hmm. a recent ad. Um, talk to us about that. Like, should you pay attention to that and how important is watching out for added sugar? Yeah, that's a good catch. They did add the added sugar to the nutrition labels a few years ago. Um, so that's really great for a consumer because it shows you how much added sugar was, was added during processing versus the naturally occurring sugars. So it's a good comparison point if you're looking at like two boxes of cereals and one has 10 grams of added sugar and the other has three, you're going to want to choose the one that has less. And a good way to think about that too is those are pretty much empty calories. Right. Right. Absolutely. And with, with clean eating, we're still, does it come to calories in and calories out and, and the clean eating is going to mm -hmm. fill you up more mm -hmm. and obviously it, it's a lot better for you mm -hmm. long term. Mm -hmm. is, is that a way to think about it? Definitely. It's more of a lifestyle than per se a diet. It's not solely intended for weight loss, but a lot of people that clean up their diets find that they have more energy, they're more satiated or satisfied when they eat. Um, and a side effect for many is weight loss because they have um, cleaned up their diet so well. Got it. That makes sense. So when it comes to our, our kiddos, they're always on the go. There's activities. You're rushing around. If your house is like mine, it gets really frantic. Yeah. What are some tips for kids and clean eating? So it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. The meal planning and prepping is super important, making sure those snacks are easy for kids to grab and go. 
A couple of things that we like to do at our house with our kiddos is we do a lot of hard-boiled eggs. So we'll boil 30 of them at a time at the beginning of the week. The kids know they can grab them and take them at any point. We always have cheese sticks, uh, applesauce pouches, yogurt pouches. They love to do air-popped popcorn. So we do that like every week and it gives us the control over the type and the amount of oil used or the amount of seasoning that we add. Um, and then we also, obviously, fruit is a natural whole food. And if you pop it in the freezer, uh, the kids really love like frozen grapes and frozen banana slices. It's a nice icy treat. Got it. Those are great tips. Thank you so much, Julie, for being here today with us. You're welcome. Thank you. After the break, we're getting the scoop on interest rates and why they shouldn't deter you from buying your dream home. Stay with us. We were there when your kid discovered poison ivy. Now remember, leaves of three. Let it be. We were there for that, and we're here for everything else. Here, it's personal, because we get to know you. People from Chicago pull for Chicago. We root for its teams, celebrate its successes, push through its challenges. When people call us the second city, it's misleading. We're second to none. We're hardworking, resilient, but we have a good time. When you live in Chicago, you proudly call this home. Your bank should too. We're Wintrust, built here, for here. And we've taken our place at Chicago's bank because no other bank can say the same. Welcome back to 630 Naperville. Up next, we're headed to Cross Country Mortgage with Kaylin Riswold to learn why you should marry the house, but date the interest rate. Welcome to Business Forward. I'm Kaylin Risvold, President and CEO of the Naperville Area Chamber of Commerce. One thing that's important to commerce is community, and that's what we're here to talk about today, the housing market, how it's doing here in our community. We are here today at Team Doyle Halsey Cross Country Mortgage with Branch Manager Matt Doyle. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I want to get some of your expertise here. Let's talk about the Naperville housing market. What's going on in our area? I've been doing this for 22 years, and I will tell you, the last two years have been a little bit of a roller coaster for a lot of people. We've seen a lot of changes in the market, but excluding those two years, I think we're getting more back to a, a normal. That's something we're used to, but we kind of forgot about two years ago. <laughs> and what do you mean when you say normal? You know, what is what are you seeing in typical timelines for housing sales? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. So normally in the past, you'd you'd list your home, and you'd see your home on the market for you know let's say 30 days or something, and you'd see a couple offers. I think we all can agree that things were a little wacky the last couple of years. Houses wouldn't even make it on the market. Tons of bids, way over asking price, and it's hard to gauge what the true market value is of places. So I think we're getting back to what your true market value is. And why do you think that is? Uh, I just think it's just the ebb and flow of a business. But getting back to an average, if somebody says, oh, I wish I would have bought a house 20 years ago, well, the best time to buy a house is do that right now. Because in 20 years, it's gonna be worth a lot more money. And it's uh, something about building generational wealth. I love that. And talking about the timing of the market, I know there's been a lot of conversation around interest rates. What are your thoughts of where we're at with interest rates and how that affects buyers? If you find a home and you're looking and it fits all your needs and it, and it checks all the boxes, marry the home, but date the interest rate. If the rates go up, whew, I'm glad I got the interest rate that I got. And if rates go down, take advantage of a refinance. Oh, that's a great way to look at it. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, so while you're here, what are your three top tips as you're looking to either get your house ready or buy or just really in this housing market as it's settling down? I, um, it, even with it settling down, I think it's just getting back to the main, the main normal. Um, I think it's a great time to purchase a home um, just because you're going to probably get a seller who is still going to do pretty good on their end. And then you're going to get a buyer that might get some better terms. And a lot of times, in the, in the past, you've got a seller who is dictating all the, all the terms of the purchase and they're holding all 52 cards. Well now, it's nice to know, I look at it as, well now some of the kings and some of the aces in that deck, they belong to the, the buyer now. And now we get something that just, it's a little bit better for both sides and anytime you can get a win-win scenario, 
um, that's when everybody wins. And in addition to the buyers and sellers winning, our community is winning by having these house sales and all of these people come into our area. Absolutely. Naperville is, uh, is a great community. And, and the reason why it's such a great community is because you have people who come in here for everything that is, is great and that Naperville has to offer from downtown to the schools to all the different um, social programs and sports. Uh, it's just great. There's checks, again, checks all the boxes. And as people live in Naperville over time, they fix up their homes, they put things in, uh, put time and, and sweat equity into their homes. And later on, their home is worth a lot more and they've paid down their loan over time and they've built some extra wealth. And, and a lot of times, people decide to sell or downsize or maybe they're relocating. And that opens the door for a whole new family to come and we restart the process over. And I think that's what's great about Naperville is that um, it's always evolving with a fresh supply of people who are here for uh, to chase the American dream. And Naperville is really good at uh, offering that. Absolutely. Anything else that, any other trends that you're seeing in our market that we should all be aware of? Um, for, for people who are looking for uh, buying a home right now, I think it's important to know that, you know, yes, you can still, um, you can dictate the terms. A lot of times, try and get the seller to, uh, instead of paying full price, Maybe you can get a little bit off, but then pay the original price and have the seller give you a credit. Have the seller pay your closing costs. Maybe if you're not putting down 20%, have the seller buy out your private mortgage insurance. You could buy down your interest rate. Uh, there's a lot of um, creative ways you can save some money and leverage your buying power, but also preserve your capital and have a little safety net. Because it's always good to have a safety net. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing some of your tips. Thank you as well for joining us for Business Forward. Hi, I'm Joe Chura and this is 630 Naperville. I'm joined now by Anita Nass of the Lotus Women's Institute. It's great to have you back today. Great to be here, Joe. So I have a question for you that no one's asking. I haven't heard it in a long time or maybe in the last few months at all. Are we in a recession? <laughs> I'm yeah. joking, of course. Right, no one's asking that. <laughs> um, well, no, you're absolutely right. Everybody seems to have that question on the top of their mind. And I would actually push back and say, is that really the right question to ask? Ooh, you got me there. What question should I be asking? Well. Let's start here. You and I could sit here until the cows come home and talk about whether it makes sense that we're in a recession or not. But guess who actually makes the determination? It's not the White House. It's not Congress. It's not even the Fed. It's a fun bunch that's called the National Bureau of Economic Research. It's a nonpartisan group of eight economists that sit around a table and make the call. The problem is that they don't make the call until long after a recession has started and ended. The reason being, the data that they look at to make the call is constantly being revised. Got it, that makes sense. So what are some examples of that? Yeah, there's quite a few metrics. So let's start with one that everybody talks about, which is the GDP, that's the gross domestic product. The general rule of thumb is that if you have two back-to-back -back quarters of negative growth, that might indicate a recession. So then you look at 2022, at the start of 2022, first quarter, we were down, GDP was down 1.6%. Second quarter, it was down about 0.9%. So there you have it, two back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP growth. So does that mean we were in a recession? Or are we still in a recession? The problem is GDP is revised often once it comes out. So we won't actually know until well into the future if those two quarters were actually negative, right? Let me give you a more solid example. Back in 2007, 2008, when the Great Recession began, the recession actually began in December of 07, but this lovely bunch did not make the call until 12 months later, December 1st of 08, that, hey, we're in a recession. So outside of GDP numbers, what are some other numbers that we should be looking at? Great question, Joe. So in addition to the word recession, the other concern on everybody's mind right now is inflation. Inflation in our country is most commonly measured by the CPI. That's the Consumer Price Index. So back in June, the CPI was up 9.1% year over year, right? And that was a 40-year high. It dipped a little bit in July to 8.5%. We're still waiting for August numbers to come out. But what happens when 
uh, inflation is spiking that way is the central bank raises rates. Well, this year, the Fed, the central bank, has raised rates about four times and probably will continue to do so. But their thought is that, hey, if we increase rates, it's going to make borrowing money more expensive, holding credit card debt more expensive. So consumers will hopefully spend less. And if that happens, demand comes down. And as demand falls, prices of goods come down as well and inflation goes down. Doesn't that just slow economic growth altogether? You are spot on. That's exactly what happens. And this is why the Fed has to walk a really fine line between, yeah, taming inflation, raising rates to do so, but not raising rates so much that they throw us into a recession. Not sure if you've heard of the phrase Goldilocks economy, but that's what they're referring to. Not too hot where inflation is high, interest rates are high, but not too cold where we're in a recessionary environment. That makes sense. Do you have any good news for us? I always have good news. Thankfully, this group doesn't only look at GDP and inflation to determine a recession. They actually look at other factors, like, for example, the job market. The job market right now, believe it or not, is actually pretty good. We dipped back down, the unemployment level did, back down to pre-pandemic levels back in July. That's really good in a fairly short amount of time. In addition to that, we've regained the majority of the 22 million jobs that were lost in March and April of 2020. That doesn't really sound like it's aligned with a recession, right? So the environment that we're in now, there's a lot of mixed signals, some good, some not so good. So this is making complete sense now why there's so much confusion around yeah. that question. Are we in a recession? Right, right. Now, does that mean we do absolutely nothing? No. It just means that we need to focus on the things that we can control. So do we save money in our household? Do we invest money in our household? Or do we run for the hills with a caseload of tuna and bottled water, right? What do we do at this moment? Well, my focus has always been, and even in my prior life as an advisor, telling clients to focus on the things that they can control. So regardless of where the markets are going, regardless of what's happening with the economy, regardless of what happens with interest rates, what are the things that we should be doing? Well, first of all, if interest rates are going up, you should definitely be thinking about paying off those high interest credit card debt because that's only gonna get worse as interest rates go up. The other aspect is if you've got extra cash lying around, you can either add to your emergency fund or you can be a contrarian when everybody else is afraid of investing right now and invest. At least in that manner, you're focusing on the things that you can control while the economy makes its own decision on whether to go into a recession or not. I love this. It's all about controlling the controllables. Absolutely. Well said. Is there anything else you'd like to add quick? You know, I think we'd also like to say that the prospect of a recession does not impact all members of our society in an equal manner. And so we just need to keep things in perspective and make sure that we're each holding ourselves accountable for our own financial futures, regardless of what happens in the economy. That was very well said. Thank you so much for being here today, Anita. It Thanks. was great to spend time with you. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Great to be here. Stay with us. After the break, we're exploring the great outdoors and taking you along for the ride. People from Chicago pull for Chicago. We root for his teams, celebrate his successes, push through his challenges. When people call us the second city, it's misleading. We're second to none. We're hardworking, resilient, but we have a good time. When you live in Chicago, you proudly call this home. Your bank should too. We're Wintrust, built here, for here. And we've taken our place at Chicago's bank because no other bank can say the same. Stay in the know, at home, or on the go with NCTV 17 News Update. This quick recap of everything happening in and around town will be delivered straight to your email inbox for free. Sign up today. Now, let's hit the trails with NCTV 17's own Justin Cornwell at the Morton Arboretum. While the Morton Arboretum has always been a great place to enjoy the best that nature has to offer in the area, 2022 is a special year for the local institution. 
There are now several opportunities to explore what the expansive property has to offer while learning more about the Arboretum's 100-year history. So the Martin Arboretum is celebrating their centennial this year, 100 years of existing as an institution. And the history hikes are one way that we are celebrating our centennial through programming. We're offering over a hundred different programs celebrating the centennial all year long and the history hikes are a way for folks to connect with the Arboretum's history, learn a little bit about those hundred years while walking the beautiful grounds here. The history hikes take participants on a two-hour guided walking tour, exploring the local flora and fauna, and of course the trees that call the Arboretum home. Along the hike, you are also taken through the initial discovery, foundation, and growth of the Arboretum, which began back in 1922, thanks to the work of Joy Morton. So the Morton Arboretum was started by one person's vision. Uh, this was Joy Morton of Morton Salt Co.'s vision for a legacy that he could leave. Uh, he founded the Arboretum in 1922 out of his personal estate. At the time, it was 175 acres, and from that original 175 acres, the Arboretum has expanded to 1,700 acres. Today we see over a million visitors, and we work here in the seven county region and all over the world to plant, protect, and study trees, and to encourage people to enjoy trees so that we'll have more trees around in the future. As the Arboretum continued to expand in size and popularity, education and conservation became vital cogs in the mission thanks to the dedication of legendary naturalist Mae Watts. The history hikes and other educational classes and programs offered year-round provide the opportunity to learn more about Watts, the Morton family, and the history of the plants and people found in the area over the past several centuries. Two main areas of history that have transpired over the years here at the Arboretum. There's the natural history, the, the trees, the landscape, how that has changed some of the trees that are much older than the hundred years of the Arboretum itself. So, People are often very interested in hearing about some of these trees that have lived here for some cases uh, two or three hundred years. But then there's also the human history of the space going back to uh, people who inhabited this place as their ancestral homeland, indigenous people that were here, uh, settlers that farmed these properties, and then the stewardship of the Arboretum uh, staff and volunteers over the past hundred years. So we try to talk as best we can, um, mentioning both of those and emphasizing for the purposes of the Centennial program, the people that have influenced the property, um, the plantings and the programs here over the past hundred years. In addition to a wide range of specialized classes and events for all ages, the Arboretum and the Chicago Region Tree Initiative are planting 3,000 trees around the seven county region and Chicago through next spring. Just one way to help ensure that local trees and the Morton Arboretum will be around to learn from and enjoy for the next 100 years and beyond. Reporting for NCTV 17, I'm Justin Cornwell. Next up, producer Kevin Maycheck is back with another Naperville gem. This one celebrates Naperville's love of the great outdoors. Naperville offers so many ways to enjoy the great outdoors. From the more than 140 parks, to the more than 110 trails covering nearly 5,000 miles, to other amenities such as Centennial Beach, the Riverwalk, athletic fields, and several dozen subdivision pools. For its 35th anniversary year, NCTV 17 is spotlighting a different gem in our community each month, and in July, we're basking in the beauty of our city's nature and all it has to offer. Whether walking, running, biking, swimming, or playing, outside recreation plays an integral part of daily life for those living in or simply visiting Naperville. Throughout the year, families enjoy special events like concerts in the park, the Naperville Kite Fest, parades and celebrations, the turkey trot and other 5K races, all al fresco. As citizens enjoy nature, they can also take in art through Naperville Century Walk a diverse collection of murals, sculptures, and other types of public art. Naperville embraces the great outdoors so much so, it even has a nearly 13-acre outdoor museum, Naper Settlement, immersing people of all ages in both local history and nature. Communities that make parks and other green spaces a priority are often found to be safer, 
develop stronger social bonds, and have residents who are generally healthier and happier. And that's why Naperville's parks and outdoor recreation are a gem that truly shine for this community. This area is really rich in natural beauty and offers so many great recreation opportunities. One of my favorite things to do in Naperville is run along the river walk, and I encourage you to get outside and do what you love. That's gonna do it for us on this edition of 630 Naperville. Remember, if you think you can do more, you can. I'm Joe Chura, and I'll see you next time.